Hey guys, it's Ben the Coin Geek at Old Pueblo Coin in Tucson, Arizona, where we have a brick and mortar store and we have a coin show that we run at uh, TucsonCoinShow.com. Also, that's it. That's all I got to say. But we're going to look at uh, large cents today and we're going to let the Red Book be our guide. We're not going to have any chain cents to look at. Spoiler alert. Or, uh, But I did want to mention here, you know, the first coins that they made, 1793, sometimes, uh, you know, the chain cent. You know, it's got gets all the glory there. Thirty-six thousand made, and then of course there's the wreath with multiple different leaves, uh, just wild, wild stuff from the wild, wild west. And then after that, you get a third change in 1793 uh, with different types of edge. Look, I gotta show you this really quick. The vine, if you've never seen the vine and bar edges versus the lettered edges, just so so cool, so so cool. So. This is a very cool, just an old basic Whitman album. And we're going to take a gander at what be inside here. And uh, of course, coins falling out. That's how these come, like all the time. So, you know, what's fun about this already, if you didn't learn anything, you should have, because we start with the 1793 where there's 112,000 made, but you just saw that you're talking about. Uh, three major type varieties between the flowing hair and the liberty capped so this is a cap liberty versus those flowing hairs and then you had your chain scent and wreath scent but also uh the edge differences there's just so many different types of things going on here that are so much fun so um in general if you want to put together large scents oftentimes you're going to be looking at coins that have this type of finish to them and there's nothing wrong with that looking through old coins that are just kind of rough and dirty. And uh, that's what you're going to get on a lot of stuff. You're going to get field finds. And it's a, actually really kind of a fun way to collect because uh, I, this is one of the few times I recommend eBay. But I'll tell you what I've seen on eBay. I see coins uh, that, you know, you can kind of cherry pick a little bit. So 1794... There's a couple of rare varieties on these guys, one of which is the stars reverse with the stars in between the uh, in between the reading. What a wild design idea that was, huh? Who came up with that? So this looks like it has them, but I can just about guarantee that's not what we're seeing there because the star should actually be between the reading and not at the end of the reading. So some of this, it looks like there is, um, there are stars there, but uh, I promise you that there are none. I shouldn't make promises. That's just a terrible idea. All right, 1794, you know, looking into the red book here, 1794, all the different varieties that they show here is just a start for the different varieties that you'll see. And you'll see that AG3s, they're showing for the common types at 300 bills, you know. So um, that's that's a whole lot of that's a whole lot of moolah for stuff like this. But the rarity is simply there with this type of stuff. How few they made and how many different varieties there are. Like I'm not doing a real variety check on these for this video. I'm just going through stuff that that uh, the crew got in here that are super cool. Um, some of my absolute favorite types of coins or the early US coins. Uh, just hard to beat. Now here, here's the thing that's wild. That that first, especially those first few years in 1793, 94, 95, like you can just see all the different styles and designs that were used. Like what's wild about the 1794 versus the 95 is the 95 looks a lot more like a flowing hair dollar uh, for the way that it's designed. You know, so, but even then, if you look in the Red Book, there are, you know, multiples of different types of designs. Je the Jefferson head, the head of 95, they call that one, the head of 94, the head of 93. So this one, I'd say, looks like that head of 93. Look at that. It's got the flowing, kind of the flowing hair to it. Now, maybe it's the 94, and this is what this is the rabbit hole, folks. This is how it all gets started. Which variety is it? Man, 
Dun, dun, dun. All right, I'm going to be wrong on this no matter what I say because I'm not, I'm just here to show off how it all begins. How it all begins, how the rabbit hole just opens up. So they have a lettered edge and a plain edge variety on these guys. So there's certain things that you can learn pretty easily from the red book, and then after that, you have to look deeper. This would appear to be the plain edge on that. Uh, edges are very important on coins in general, and that is no exception. 1796, they only made 109,000 of these guys uh, from that date. And once again, you see you're running into a lot of the same things on those other coins. Just a whole lot of... Uh, a whole lot of um, looks like they've been dug up, looks like they've been run over, maybe shot at a couple times. But uh, once again, you've got a lot of different varieties for every different year on these copper coins. And there's a, there's huge, huge books on the early US cents that you can go through and just look and see the different types that are out there. Now Now we get even, because it, you know, it starts out murky and it gets murkier. So right, 1796, we're gonna flip the page here to the 1797. And of course, now you've got, um, uh, you've got two different styles. So 1796 actually has two different main styles too, because you've got the, the flowing hair style, which is what we had here, and then you have the draped bust style. So 1796, another major design change versus a minor design change. And once again, the Red Book points out some of the main differences here because you can still have reverses that were used from 1794, five, and seven. So here's the 1796 drape bust with all the different reverse types, but they used them a lot of each. So you'll see the price points are actually somewhat similar. And one of the ways to use the Red Book is to go ahead and look and see not exact price points, but just is there a big difference in price on one thing over the other, right? So the the Lihertisk error, right? So they show that here where it looks like an H instead of a B. And so that is, they give you the example of what that looks like. And then there's some, some sub-varieties, the stemless reverse, the gripped edge, lots of different things to look at. So lots of different things as we move forward throughout the series. Uh, 1797, let's look at this guy here. So this guy, I wanna see if they mention, they got the different edges on this. They're not mentioning here a restrike. In my mind, this is a restrike. When I look at this, um, oh, I know what I'm thinking of, an electrotype. Yeah, this appears to be an electrotype. This is not something that appears in the normal listings on the Red Book. Uh, an electrotype is um, when they took the dies and they recast them. I'm gonna use all the wrong words here and drive somebody nuts. So one of you guys who you know collects electrotypes very specifically, you can just put, put your answer down here. Put your answer in the box. Use a number two pencil, please. But it's basically a um, a restrike, and I will have to uh, once again probably do a separate a separate video just on that guy, if that is what I think it is. So then we're going to turn the page here, and we're not even out of the 1700s yet. We're better get our uh, our track shoes on here real quick. Although most of you enjoy just kind of digging into old coins, so it's all good. We'll. We'll keep digging here. By the way, you can see why, well, first of all, um, why we don't wear gloves normally when you handle coins. Uh, you know, most coin graders won't wear gloves, you know, when they handle something because, in of course, you can get gloves that fit a little bit better than these ones are fitting right now, but also, even then, you don't have the same control that you would, and then this happens. Look at that. This entire show is a comedy of errors. Okay, so I'm just going to run down some of the overall high points here using the Red Book 1798. They've got a bunch of different types there. Once again, they start with AG instead of like good or BG. And then you've got uh, some of the major types here, but you can see the guys that are really tough, the 1799, although, you know, they made uh, 900,000 of them. Super rare date. 
super rare date just based on the price point. And then once you get into the new uh, century or millennia or century, uh, yeah, actually the century technically starts in 1801, but don't tell anybody. Um, you'll start to see, you know, a lot more of a price reduction on most of the main types. And then you start seeing it's just some of the subtypes that have a lot of the big price point changes. So once again, you know, 1803, 3 million minted main types are not super expensive subtype really rare. And of course, the crazy thing is when you start looking at some of this stuff here, 1804 is a rare date, you'll start seeing, um, you start seeing what you want to see. So you start seeing every time you look at an 1803, you'll think it's the large date small fraction. And over time, you find out that it's just it's just not. 1804, this is an unofficial restrike. So this is what I was talking about with that 1797, that, uh, you know, these were made from a discarded mint die. Um, so they were struck circa 1860. How, how odd is that? Isn't that weird? I mean, this is stuff that unless you actually go through the Red Book, you don't really see. But uh, these are cool. I've had those before. 1805, 1806. Okay, let's start looking at some of these here. Of course, the 1799 is not there. That's that's the big the big winner we were talking about earlier, right? And then after that, you can just see how rough these other guys are. Your 1800, your 1801 is basically not there. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit on this bad boy and see what that date looks like. Let's see if we can get a one on there. Oh, uh, it's there, 01. So some of these coins, you know, you see just that huge inflation all of a sudden with the amount that were minted versus those early issues with, you know, less than a million, all of a sudden you're popping up to two, three million real quick. So the mint really got their act together and started popping out coins big time in the early 1800s. There's your 1803. Let's get a good shot at the date on that guy. Sometimes I just say it and it happens. And other times I say it and it just doesn't happen. All right, we're going to move into 1804. See that super rare date is not there, of course. 1805, 1806. So I just want to talk a little bit more about overall planchet quality and collecting so like i said you can go on ebay and find really rough coins usually for not too much money where collectors really start to pay premiums on these guys is when you get into something that has a higher surface quality you can see how almost every coin here has some type of corrosion to it and so collectors uh, you know most coin series what happens is you run into the different coins and you know you the coin is discounted for being problematic and uh, certainly you can be, you know, discounted here too, but actually it almost works in reverse with early U.S. copper where coins really are worth a high premium if they're very, very original in their overall quality. All right, no 1804 to speak of, 1805 and 6, not super rare. There's an 1807 over 6. Uh, did we have that guy, 1807? Let's see here. Let's take a look at him. Let's see if we can find an 1807 over 6. Mm, and there's that corrosion in the way. Also, you know, you would... Um, see, it's funny. Like I was saying, it, it feels like whenever you see a variety that um, as soon as you look at a co coin that's corroded, you're like, I can see it, I can see it. But uh, I think you need to see a little bit more of a bar coming in between the top of the seven and the bottom of the seven on that coin. All right. Now we moved from 1807 and 1808, we moved into what they call the classic head style. These coins are very tough to get in higher grade. One of the things that we're just looking at low grade coins, but one of the things you'll notice is that once you get into the middle grades, you know, bada bing. Right? I mean, you're looking at $1,000 coins, whereas, you know, these rougher coins are a little bit more collector friendly. So you will you will notice that at 1809, you may have noticed when we're looking at it right here, that only 222,000 were made. 
and that is a tougher, tougher date. And then as we flip the page here, 1811, there's an 11 over O, which is a pretty common variety. You can see that even though it's like, oh, cool, it's a variety, but then you find out that it's pretty much the same price as the normal date until you get into higher grades. And that's because so many of them were made with that over date. Uh, 1812, once again, common, 13. 14 has always been a little bit tougher, that 357,000, um, especially a nicer grade, but also it's just a little bit harder to come by. And then all of a sudden you go from there, that, that's a pretty short-lived series. All of a sudden you move into the 1816, uh, the 1816 window, and you've got a whole new coin design. So you go and all of a sudden we've got yet another new coin design. And so you're talking about a 20-year window basically, and how many, how many different design styles do you have specifically, and then that's without getting into all of your little subcategories. And so once you get into the, the 1820s, all of a sudden, you know, you see the mintages here. You have that two, three, four million again. And then you hit 1821. It's like 389,000. 1822, they pop it up again. 1823, under a million again. And then um, 1824, 1.3, 1825, 1.5. So it's, it's always been intriguing to me to see just how just how the mintages fluctuate over time when you look at this stuff. And once again, the red book shows you some varieties, but it's nothing compared to the number of varieties that exist. There's common varieties, but then there's just like all the sub varieties that people get into with the different specific dyes. I mean, you can just look at how differently the dates were made in 18, 1820. You know, so uh, in that 1821, where they had only 389,000 made, you can see, of course, that one becomes pretty tough to get, especially in higher grades. But also, you can see as we go further down the book, now they don't start in AG, they start in good, and they don't only go up to VF, they start showing grades in XF, AU, and even uncirculated grades. You know, and that's just based on overall availability. So some of the old blue books on a coin that's really rare, they wouldn't even have a hole for it. They'd have just a punch out that said rare. And so you'll see that sometimes, um, I mean, the reason they don't list some of those prices on the earlier coins and higher grades, because they're just so rare, it doesn't seem like very practical for them to do. So here's another unofficial restrike, 1823. Um, so there's all kinds of wild and crazy stuff you can get into with large sense. And so this basic old school Whitman album, which is just a trifold, covers uh, 1793 to 1825 and it's just kind of cool and so you can have fun picking up uh, old large cents like I said on eBay lower grade coins they're just falling out of the holders lower grade coins lots of times you'll see coins for you know 20 to 50 dollar range on a lot of this type of stuff and then of course some of the earlier stuff that's where it gets specialized some of these things I'm going to have to go back and do very specific research because there are so many sub varieties, especially on the stuff from the 18th century, that uh, can really pop in value. So we will have to do research on some of those bad boys. But, uh, anyways, guys, thanks so much for watching. I'm Ben the Coin Geek. You can subscribe by clicking on the owl button in the corner and watch more videos on the right side of the screen. Thanks.